All right, welcome back to New York City. We're here at MongoDB Local. You're watching theCUBE's coverage, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, all the innovation, it's all about AI, LLMs, going up the stack, building new apps. Siraj Patel is here, he's the head of MongoDB Ventures, a CUBE alum, and Brandon Duderstadt is also here. He's the founder and CEO of Nomic, uh, one of the portfolio companies of MongoDB. Gents, good to see you again. Thanks, Thanks for having us. You. You're very welcome. Brandon, let me start. I, I always ask founders of company, why'd you start the company? Yeah, so if we take a look at the journey, it really started a company called Rad AI, which is where I was at before this. Um, and that company was building transformers back in 2018 for use on radiology data. Um, and so we were working out of like the original attention to tensor repo from Google. And one of the things that we learned is if you want to be able to deploy LLMs in these incredibly high impact domains like medicine or defense or finance, where you really have a vested interest in them being accurate, there's this massive data curation challenge that you have to overcome. And so the way that at that company we were able to take that model and get it to performing better than radiologists was really taking a lot of time working with subject matter experts, really getting into the data the model was producing, the training data, and going through this arduous curation process. And so what that really taught me was two things. One, the fact that we were able to get this model to outperform doctors at radiology meant these models are going to be everywhere in five years. And two, there needs to be some kind of tooling that lets both the machine learning engineer and the subject matter expert interact and collaborate on the massive unstructured data sets that power these things. And so that's why I left to start Nomic. To really get into that uh, domain specific, Molly, two years ago we put out the Cubes, Cube Research put out the AI power law, and we tried to think about power laws and how it's going to apply here. And you know, the, we, we took liberty, we basically said, okay, you got size of model, but then you got model specificity on the horizontalized. That's really what's playing out. Was that what you saw when you decided to invest in Nomic? It was actually a little bit of a different thesis when we invested in Nomic. Um, we were thinking more generally, like at, at the time, Brandon told you how he started Nomic, and then uh, he probably had some foresight into what was going to happen, um, but certainly the rubber hit the road with ChatGPT's release in 2022. Um, and when we met Nomic a few months later, uh, we were seeing this phenomena of not necessarily subject matter experts, but software developers that really wanted to understand what's going into models, how are models being trained. Um, and Nomic had this really powerful visualization um, that allowed someone that maybe doesn't day-to-day -day work in ML engineering or ML research uh, to actually hover over different data points that are going in to train the model, understand the relationship between those data points, um, and curate that data. Um, so we saw it from a MongoDB perspective, our persona has always been the software developer. We saw this as a really powerful tool to enable software developers to get dangerous with AI. Yeah, right behind us, MongoDB has a little you know, kiosk where you've got the in, in investment companies, your portfolio companies. And I walked, I walked by, I didn't see this, the, the, the branding of Nomic, but I saw this, what looked like a knowledge graph to me, this visualization that was very cool. Explain what I was looking at. Yeah, so the, we call that the map, and that's part of our progress, uh, product, Nomic Atlas, which is distinct from MongoDB Atlas. Oh, oh okay. Uh, which is a fun little, fun little game we always play. But in Nomic Atlas, every piece of your data set is a point on a scatter plot, and two points are close if the content of that data is similar. And so what you start to see are these emergent structures where we're able to group the data by its similarity. We're able to label those clusters with kind of semantic, you can think of them as landmarks. And we can apply a lot of different visualization techniques on top of it, letting you search it, filter that data, color it by different metadata. And so suddenly you can detect these trends in your data and these relationships that if you were just looking at it in a table or maybe in you know, something like a matplotlib visualization that's not interactive, it would be incredibly hard to discover. And so, you know, one of my favorite quotes from one of our downstream customers, Smarter X, is uh, they say, you know, one of my favorite things about Nomic Atlas is I can find something new about my data within the first five minutes of using the product, and I can still discover new things about my data after using the product for hours. And we think that really speaks to the power. And then uh, I'm using that to build apps. One of the problems that we've had with our RAG was that, that somebody described this to me, it really resonated, is that it's, it, these, these LLMs are like Swiss cheese. When the data is there, it's actually really good. When it's not, you've got all these holes, and if the AI goes into those holes, it'll start grabbing from other data, and that's when it really starts to hallucinate. And so I know others are, are working on that problem. So you know, we've tried to figure out, okay, how can we avoid either going into that hole or provide other data to, to fill those holes? How do you guys, is that, a, is that a problem that you're seeing, and how do you deal with that? 
Yeah, so, you know, on the topic of RAG, there's a couple things here. One, that's certainly a phenomenon that we can visualize in the platform, you yeah. know. If you take your RAG data set, you will put it into the map, and then you have your query stream streaming into the map. You'll see if there are queries that are appearing in locations where you don't have that context. And, you know, if you're collecting ratings on that data, suddenly you can color by that and start to see, oh, you know, the poorly rated things are in this area. There's no training data there. There's no RAG there or data, or, you know, RAG data there. Yeah, yeah. We have to do something about that. But even going a step beyond that and getting into one of Nomic's other product offerings, which is Nomic Embed, one of the most important parts of RAG is retrieving the right data. And so one of the things that Nomic has done is we've released this model, Nomic Embed. It's the first truly open, that's open source, weights, and data model that outperforms no, um, OpenAI's embedding models on both short and long context tasks. And we've seen massive adoption of this thing. We just, you know, passed a million downloads on Hugging Face, and we're really excited about enabling, you know, the entire broader developer community to do RAG, uh, you know, with their fully open source stack powered by Nomic. What about the economics of that? Can you, can you address that? You, you, you're getting, you know, better results. Are the economics also... Uh, Superior? Yeah, so one of the things that, you know, we think a lot about at Nomic, and this goes into a third offering, GPT for All, is the unit economics of these models. So I think what we're seeing right now are a lot of industries experimenting with the models. And so they're turning to something that's very general purpose, be it like a GPT-4 or a Claude Opus. Um, and what I think you'll see is over time, as organizations start to understand where in the flow chart of data through their organization these models fit, they're going to become more price sensitive to these things. And so they're going to start turning to more specialized, uh, you know, more compressed, more edge deployable models. And so, you know, where GPT for all comes into play is it's a platform that allows us to take these specialized models and compress them and run them either, you know, in the cloud on hardware that is more efficient or, you know, on the edge on a user device. And suddenly, you know, if you have a really well-specified operational domain, you can get the same level of performance as a GPT-4 or a Claude, but for a fraction of the cost. Awesome. Thank you for that. Suraj, zooming out, can you just sort of describe MongoDB's sort of investment philosophy? And then specifically, knowing what you've seen with Nomic over the last, you know, a couple of years, how it applies there? Yeah. So at a high level... MongoDB as a whole, our mission at the company is to empower innovators to use software and data um, to disrupt industries. And so MongoDB Ventures, we look for founders that share in that mission. Um, and I think that when we met Brandon, as we mentioned, that was exactly what he was working on. Um, he was thinking about the bottlenecks that, whether it's a software developer or ML researcher, as they're thinking about training a model, fine tuning a model, um, or putting a RAG system into production, what are the different ways that they approach this problem of what data set should I use? Um, how do I understand that data set? And then actually beyond that, they had also recently released uh, a product called GPT for All, uh, which had incredible open source adoption, allowed uh, developers to run, or actually anybody to run models locally on their machine. Um, and again, it, it reflected on an incredible empathy uh, for the developer and or the technical creator um, that really wants to bring AI into everyday applications. Um, so that's why we invested in Nomic and super happy to do so. I, I wonder if we could get your thoughts, both of you, on where you see sort of LLMs going and, and AI going. If you just start with LLMs, there's a debate out there about whether these things become commoditized. You hear it on all the talking head shows. And the premise is, well, because everything gets you're replaced, you know, GPT-2 is, who cares, GPT-3, 4, so GPT-5 is going to come out and nobody's going to care about GPT-4 anymore. So it's going to become one big, you know, commoditized bin. Others say, well, no, as long as the innovation continues, it won't be commoditized. VC hat on, how do you think about it? And then we'll ask the entrepreneur how he sees it. I don't think the models are going to be commoditized completely. Um, if we think about a world in which there's no post-transformer architecture, if we're confined to transformer architectures, then uh, GPU capacity is incredibly important. And there's only a few players that will have the data sets and the GPU capacity to train a world-class kind of frontier model. Um, so there may be multiple players, you know, Anthropic's done a great job with their latest cloud release. Um, OpenAI is always at the forefront. Uh, so there, there will be multiple players, but that list is not going to be 20, in our opinion, um, that list is going to be confined to a half dozen or less. 
Do you have a thought on that, Brandon? Yeah, so the way I see this all playing out, I think of it as sort of concentric rings of intelligence. So in the sort of centermost ring, you have models that run locally on your machine. These things are always going to be the least intelligent because they have access to the least number of flops. But over time, they'll become more intelligent, right? If we look at running Llama 3 on my MacBook now, it's, you know, a world better than, you know, running the original Llama release on my laptop, just in terms of the quality of the outputs and so on and so forth. And so, you know, you're always going to have something that you're going to want to be personalized running on your computer. Maybe there's sensitive data involved. Maybe you don't have the ability to communicate with a server. Uh, maybe it's just cheaper. That's almost always going to be cheaper. And then one ring out from that is going to be perhaps your organization's language model, which might be a fine tune or has, you know, rag from your organization's context, um, you know, across maybe your company or your industry or what have you that you can call out to for certain kinds of problems. And you're going to lose a little bit of that privacy and you're going to pay a little bit more for that, but you're going to be able to bring in context uh, that maybe you wouldn't have on the local machine. And then one ring out from that are going to be, I think, these big sort of like AGI players, which are going to be the most expensive models where you have to send your data away um, and you have the least kind of data protections, but they are going to offer, you know, the most intelligence because they can utilize the most flops. And so the way I see this field evolving is we will always have these sort of concentric rings and there's going to, you know, because of innovation, there will always be pressure that is taking uh, the level of intelligence in the outermost ring and pushing it closer and closer to the device. And so I think there's going to be room for all of these players in the limit. And, and, you know, you mentioned flops, and some people say, well, flops really isn't the issue. It's, it's, it's flops per watt and things like that, which right. is, by the way, true. But I always say flops matter. Because if you look at the combinatorial effects of the GPUs, CPUs, NPUs, ASICs, L now LPUs, and what you're able to do here, and as inference becomes the dominant workload, I think it, last year at Mobile World Congress, MWC, Qualcomm, I think, showed a 7 billion parameter model running on a smartphone. And I think they said to me in the cube that they'd be an order of magnitude more than that next year, which just blew me away. And so that to me says there's going to be so much distributed power and the way in which applications are going to be written is going to completely change. How do you see, first of all, do you agree? And how do you see Mongo sort of playing in that world? Yeah, so I can almost guarantee you the model they were running is not a 7B model, but a quantized 7B model. Yeah, sure. Very different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And we can get into that if you want. But no, I get it. Though. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Right. It's um, I do think, you know, from the standpoint of if you look at the scaling laws for these models, it's obvious that if you can coordinate more compute towards a task, you are going to get a better end result. And even as the dominant kind of paradigm moves to inference, we're seeing this idea of chaining multiple inferences together to achieve a better result. So if you look at, say, the idea of a validator prompt, which is not only asking a model for an answer, but then asking it to check its work, you're doing twice as many calls to the model, twice as many flops, but suddenly the performance increases. And so I don't see this idea of more flops equals better outcome going away. And frankly, that's been the story of computing since, you know, the computer became a thing. Um, as far as flops per watt goes, I definitely see, you know, power becoming the next massive constraint here. Um, and it's going to be fascinating to watch the dynamics of the, en the uh, energy industry and the, uh, you know, infrastructure for moving that energy over the next five years as organizations start to ramp up. And the last kind of piece that I'll say here is the idea of synthetic data. And so one of the things that I think is going to really accelerate inference workloads is the fact that, you know, we see with things like, you know, Dolly 3, for instance, the idea of recaptioning that synthetic data can massively move the needle on the quality of these models. And so now you have this massive inference problem before you can even train the next thing. And that's even going to further accelerate the demand for not only compute, but for energy and so on and so forth. So thank you. Th thoughts on how MongoDB plays in that space? Yeah, I think people, when they think MongoDB is AI play, maybe default and think about our vector search. Um, and certainly a lot of vector search workloads are related to AI. A lot of them are powering RAG architectures. Uh, but one of the things that Brandon touched on, which is this idea that when you put an AI application into production, uh, there's multiple calls to an LLM or any type of AI model. Um, there's responses, and all of those calls and responses are recorded somewhere. I think one of the unanticipated things that we saw is that a lot of people are leveraging the fact that MongoDB is schemaless um, to record that type of data in MongoDB. And it's a new workload that's taking off quite quickly for us. More real time. Do you see a day, because it seems like most applications today, the architecture is, um, um, I'm calling one LLM at a time. And, and I don't think anybody's figured out how to do simultaneous calls to multiple LLMs. 
I don't even know what that world looks like. Do you, do you see that happening? What's the technical challenge there? I wonder if you could comment. Yeah, so I was talking to, um, you know, Harrison at Langchain and Jerry at Llama Index about this particular thing. And so I was asking, you know, what kinds of agent or cognitive architectures are we seeing nowadays? Is it just a simple rag with one LLM or are we seeing more advanced things? And right now, I think we're in the very early days. And they told me, you know, 90% of the users are just hooking the LLM up to a vector database. And that's kind of the whole app. But those 10% of users that are going beyond that and, you know, are today orchestrating many LLMs at different levels of, um, you know, sophistication. So maybe sometimes local, sometimes calling out to, you know, a GPT-4 or a Claude and doing some of this more bespoke uh, cognitive architecture modeling. Um, they're seeing that start to pick up and they're seeing the real power behind those applications. And so I think as developers get their hands on this technology and are enabled by, you know, some of the work that Mongo is doing now, um, to actually have this stuff running on their machine in different dev environments and in the open source, they're going to be able to orchestrate increasingly complex apps that are going to be uh, increasingly featureful and capable. And I think that's the thing that people sometimes miss, you know, when you listen to think the all-in pod, they would go crazy. It's so easy, this stuff. And you're going to be able to, the, 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 you're going to, be able to do more with far fewer developers, but, but to really get that big... ROI, not so much the percentage, but the big numbers, the transformative. You know, Dev was talking about the the waves, yeah. and he's it always happens. You hit the, the the hype cycle or whatever, and you think about back in you were probably still in kindergarten, Brandon. But <laughs> but the but the dot com, you know, you had Lycos, uh, uh, you had AOL was the granddaddy of them. I mean, there so many of those are gone. Who ended up winning? It was Amazon. It was Google. It, it was obviously the social media folks that were, weren't even around in the early dot-com days. I, I, I see something similar happening here where it's going to take some time. I don't know, is it your investment horizon is oftentimes eight to ten years yeah. to build a company. I still think it's going to take that long to solve some of these problems. You're just going to be able to do it maybe with a lot less resources, or maybe you're going to need as many resources, but it's going to change the world in ways that we can't even imagine. Do you see that sort of the same dynamic playing out? Yeah, when I think about... so. We invest in infrastructure, so companies are really enabling innovators to create the end-user application. Um, and we love that area of the stack, and we think that several winners will emerge from that area of the stack. If I think about the application layer, though, um, what's interesting is I think today we are seeing basically people AI-enable existing workflows. Um, and with every platform shift, you see this period of time where people are enabling existing workflows on the new platform. Um, and at some point, we're going to get to a point where new workflows are created that are native to that platform. Um, so if you think about how long into the mobile cycle it took for an Uber to be created, which was really an experience that could only happen once there was mobile maturity, I don't think we're there yet in terms of AI applications and seeing truly AI native workflows yet. Um, and certainly, the other aspect that I think about a lot is the AI applications we are seeing today, they're making some tough math work. Right. The, as Brandon was saying, if you're taking multiple calls to a model, now you have to figure out, OK, do I host that model myself? Do I put it on the public cloud, depending on how big the model is? Do I need a high performance GPU? Um, can I use the last gen GPU? Uh, so all of these economic calculations, I don't think many of them have been figured out in a meaningful way. Yet. It is, um, I guess, so many questions. First of all, Uber, that's a great example. We envision Uber for all, you know, that is real time, people, places and things. Um, is all the action happening in the cloud today, or is it actually creeping on-prem? What are you seeing there? Both. Um, it is. I think okay. some of the model, some of the LLMs that you talk to, um, they're finding interesting use cases in financial services, healthcare, where people aren't comfortable uh, sending calls outside of their, uh, their four walls. Um, and actually, Br Brandon and I were having a talk about this uh, just yesterday. Um, maybe you want to touch... Um, yeah, in terms of the difference between like VPC links, or... GPT for all, and the traction you're seeing oh, in terms of sure. local. Yeah, for sure, sure. So, yeah, one of the things that we see with GPT for all is the extreme of that, which is bringing the model to the end device. Um, so, the entire sort of value prop of that tool chain is you can take something like a Llama 3 quantized to, you know, 4 bit or 8 bit and run it at 20 tokens a second on a MacBook. And now suddenly you have the ability to, you know, use that if maybe you don't have Wi-Fi, maybe you have sensitive data, you don't want to pay for those GPU workloads. And so it comes back to this idea of the concentric circles of intelligence, where I think, you know, in the near future, like probably less than a couple of years, you're going to have language models that ship 
you know, burned into the actual chips of these devices. Um, I certainly know, you know, Apple is investing in this idea with their M series processors and is super well positioned because of that. Um, yeah, but, but I sure. think that's going to become increasingly common. Uh, do you do you agree that you're going to need GPU power there to do that? E even even an in inference, it, it, you know, it's it's simple matrix math, but there's a lot of it. Do you, yes. is, is that is that correct assumption that you are going to need Z, uh, GPUs at the edge? You're going to need something that looks somewhat like a GPU, right? So like if you look at what Apple is doing, right, they have like the integrated memory things. Yeah. It's like not quite a GPU, but it's not quite not a GPU. And you're going to need something like that. But the ability to coordinate a massively parallel number of threads is really what you're looking for. And I think we're going to see this whole spectrum of bespoke kind of end device hardware that does that. Well, and you need a shared SRAM. That's one of the things we talk about all the time in the Cube. Do you need a big shared SRAM monolithic, you know, chip to do that? Or is this chiplet architecture with what I think a relatively slow asynchronous connection is going to do it? There's probably room for both. Topic for another day. Yeah. But uh, guys, thanks so much for coming to the Cube. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, keep it right there. We're live at MongoDB Local from the Big Apple. You're watching the Cube.